Excellent. Okay. So, got this little HDMI guy Perfect. going. Perfect. I've got an HDMI connection here. I need to probably plug my laptop in because it is an old dinosaur. Cool. I think Allison's is this one. I'll trace do some horology here. Should be right Spent behind all day you on chasing. the yellow. There you yep. go. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, there you go. There's Allison's cord. Perfect. Howdy, Perfect. man. 
Hello. Can you move all my stuff? We have food here. We got you. Oh. Is that your bag? No. Okay. <laughs> That's confusing. Is that is it That's your mouse? No, no. No, that was okay. Did you need the clicker? Uh, I think I'll use my mouse actually. Okay. Did your mouse? Do you need that? a pointer for anything? No, no, I should. How will you use your mouse while mouse while standing? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Holy. Uh, I can run it. Oh, it's on this side. Wow, it's taking a while. You can do a projector. <laughs> okay. You'll have to charade this whole pot. So. <laughs> oh, wow. Mm. <laughs> we'll get the spotlight ready. Um, okay. How's computer going? It's fine. I think it just switches its... Uh, it switches its screen. We we unplug the projector. The computer screen should come back up. Oh, I guess not. No. Wait for the program to respond. Maybe. Well, we can close it. I think. We got some time. The tour is still going. Oh. Oh, excellent. Okie dokie. What time did tour leave? 6.30 because okay. okay, okay. That makes sense. Great that that's really yeah. eavesdropped. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, okay. And that we had that list. Yeah. I wonder you're like, per this, I don't think that's actually your job. Well, I, I did check because I was like, I don't think she needs ever get it. I don't know like, how well she was So I was just like, um, are I you guess comfortable BFL. doing this by yourself? Oh yeah, sad. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And she's like, oh yeah, totally. You're okay, I just want to make sure you weren't hmm. open someone else's How's it going? If need be, you can... Oh, hey! We're getting Maybe something. Sassy. Thinking about it, thinking about it. Oh, right, right. I see. Presentation. <laughs> Test with your mouse. Yeah, let's see. Oh, oh excellent. Excellent. Okay. Okay. Well, go back. Please. Computer, iPhone. Brilliant. I have no idea that actually with the. Okay. 75%? Yeah, that's probably. That was good. It's gonna get. Okay. Because, yeah. This is not plugged into. Excellent. Is it complex? What time is it? It is start time. Oh, 7 o'clock. But we're still waiting for this tour to... Yes, of course, of course. I don't have Jenny's... Oh, but I see little flashlights, so I ah, think there everybody they are. is approaching. Excellent. The speakers usually use a microphone. I think I have yes. plenty of uh, yes. Yes. projection. No, we do. <laughs>
All right. Can everyone hear me in the back? Awesome. Well, thank you for coming out, everyone. Um, hope you're enjoying the lovely weather. And just in time for St. Patrick's Day, we have Tristan Kubik talking to us about fermented Fantasia. So without further ado, Tristan. Thank you, Allison. Uh, thank you all. Uh, I practiced this talk without a microphone, so if I need to speak up or things are getting weird, just let me know. Um, uh, without further ado, uh, I just want to give a brief background about this talk. This talk was actually scheduled to happen two years ago, but uh, I think we all remember what happened two years ago in March. Uh, the state shut down uh, because the COVID-19 virus had arrived. <laughs> uh, and then I was offered to give this presentation again a year ago, but I figured it just had to happen in person uh, because I talk a lot with my hands, as I'm sure you all will kind of see this evening. Uh, but, but another sort of point related to that is this, this is my, probably my most favorite topic in the world to talk about. And I'm so excited to share this talk. It's been two years uh, in the making. Uh, so without further ado, let's dive into this evening's talk about fermented Fantasia and uh, my attempt to spoil you all rotten this evening with one of my favorite stories. Um, so uh, a little bit about this talk this evening, folks. Uh, it's a biology talk. A lot of the Science Under the Stars talks are biology talks because uh, it's the biology grad students that put them on. Uh, but unlike a lot of those talks, we're going to bring some really sort of fun and maybe disgusting things to the dinner table, some topics that aren't usually welcome around the dinner table. Uh, some of those things include mold fun bacteria. We're going to talk about some of those in depth today. Uh, we're going to be talking about burping and farting. Uh, so this is a very fun topic. Again, topics not usually uh, showcased in a, in a professional science talk here. Uh, we're also going to be talking about chewing with our mouths open because we need to see what happens to food when we start to digest it, both ourselves and our, our microbial friends. Um, now, this is a scary word for some people. It was for me for a long time. Uh, but hopefully this evening you will all leave a little bit better chemists uh, than when you arrived. So uh, we're going to do some chemistry, but we'll make it fun and simple. So nobody be scared of chemistry. Uh, and then lastly, my favorite topic. Uh, we have a balloon in the back there even. Uh, we're going to be talking a lot this evening about bubbles and gases because they are inevitable when food starts getting broken down. Uh, all right. Um, now, a little bit about myself here. Um, I am, this is me over here uh, in the orange shirt with a, a bucket and some boots. Um, my father was an entomologist, that's someone who studies insects, and uh, I quickly fell into line with his footsteps. This is my house uh, over here, that's my, my high school car, which I promptly wrecked a while back, but uh, we can ignore that. Um, but I grew up in rural Colorado, so insects, it was like an insect wonderland for me. I, I could just go out into the woods and collect insects. Uh, I pursued that passion to Colorado State University up in Fort Collins, uh, where I graduated with a degree in biochemistry and entomology. Uh, and then I chased that passion here to UT, where, you know, I, I study ants. And, you know, not much has changed. I still love to wear the color orange and uh, still have boots and a net and, and go out there and chase insects. Um, so that, that might have you all wondering, well, what on earth is an entomologist doing talking to you about fermented beverages? Uh, and I think the first clue to that question, which it's a good question, uh, is in my ancestry. Uh, so I am from Colorado, and my last name is Cubic. Um, that's a Czech last name. Um, but it's important, one, one data uh, of import to note here is that five of Colorado's cities are among the top 20 in the world uh, in terms of breweries per capita. It's no lie to say that Colorado is a craft beer state. Uh, and so I grew up in a craft beer state here. Um, and now here's another little fun fact for you about beer and uh, some geography here. The Czech Republic, this wonderful country in sort of central eastern Europe, um, the Czech Republic consumes more beer per capita than any other country in the world. Uh, and so now that we know these kind of two facts, it seems almost inevitable that I would fall into some sort of fermentation science, uh, just given my lineage, my heritage here. Uh, and it's true to say that even while I was chasing insects, something was brewing deep inside of me, and it was this craving uh, to get after some beer. Um, so uh, in many ways, you can think of this as sort of a duality here. You know, I I'm, I'm study ants, but, but I'm also very much a, a brewer. Uh, and in fact, I'm, I'm a professional brewer. So you all are in the hands of a pro this evening. 
Uh, I started professionally brewing at Lazarus Brewing Company here in Austin. Uh, I'm now a brewer at Oscar Blues. Um, I'm a member of the Master Brewers Association of the Americas and a proud member of the Texas Craft Brewers Guild. So yes, I also have some beer background here and some fermentation background. Uh, I'm a professional now. Um, uh, so I also started a small brewery out in Smithville. It was a passion project. It didn't last long, uh, but it was probably the best six months of my life uh, with my business operator here. Uh, we called ourselves Smithville Sudworks, but uh, you won't find us around much longer these days. Maybe again in the future sometime. Um, so enough about me, that's kind of boring and old stuff. Uh, let's get into the meat of the talk. Uh, and we can't talk about fermentation without talking about food. Uh, and so a good way to dive into that is to ask, how do we eat? And here's a nice little diagram. Um, you know, all of you are eating tonight, so feel free to chew with your mouths open and help your neighbors take in this information here. Um, we start by chewing our food in our mouths, of course, where our teeth mash it up, and then it goes down our esophagus, into our stomach, through our intestines, and all the while, our bodies are doing this to food. It's breaking it up into smaller and smaller pieces. And that's true uh, on the macroscopic level, like this banana here, as it is on the, on the molecular level. Um, and so this, does anyone know what molecule this is? Mm-hmm. Mm, this is, oh, wow, we have a genius over here. Carbohydrate, correct. This is, this is a monocarbohydrate. This is perhaps the most important monocarbohydrate uh, in the world. Most of you know this as sugar. Uh, this is this molecule here is sugar, and these little black dots are carbon, and we're going to be chasing carbon all over the place tonight. So keep your eyes on squirrely carbon. Um, but again, food is all about uh, breaking things up into tinier pieces. Our bodies, you know, we take a bite out of an apple, we're turning it into smaller pieces, uh, and our cells actually bust sugar up into smaller pieces. This is carbon dioxide gas right here, and again, we're chasing those carbons. Look, there was six in sugar, and now we get six CO2 molecules out of here. Um, so. This poses a question, why do we eat? Can anyone answer why do we eat? It seems like a simple question. I heard, I heard it over here, someone said it begins with E. Energy. energy, pow! Doing this, breaking things into smaller pieces releases useful energy that our bodies can use to do all sorts of fun stuff, uh, like running, giving talks, you know, uh, powering your eyes so you can watch cool talks. Yeah, so we bust things up to generate biologically useful energy. Um, now, again, like I said, this is not the last time we'll be talking about this molecule right here. This is carbon dioxide. There's one carbon, two oxygens. The oxygens are in red here. CO2, I'm going to drive this point home to you all because this is a very important molecule for this evening's talk. Carbon dioxide. Um, and one of the important things about carbon dioxide is that it is a gas at room temperature, which means it forms bubbles when you put it in liquid. Uh, and that's actually a very, very important part of CO2. Uh, so we'll, we'll continue to reference our good buddy carbon dioxide this evening. Um, now, as we said, eating releases energy, but we don't get energy for free. We have to expend energy to make energy. It's kind of like making a little bit of a short-term investment. Um, and, and that can look like many different things. So um, if you're a hunter-gatherer, uh, for instance, you're going out, you're spending lots of energy looking for prey items to subdue. If you're a farmer, you're spending lots of energy sowing seeds and, and raising crops and weeding fields uh, to eventually get a payoff. Um, but we see some shorter-term investments of energy um, from chewing your food. You need energy to power the muscles that chomp your food up. You need energy to make your stomach muscles work, and you need energy to make stomach acid to help you digest this food. Um, so, so food does not come for free for us. So keep that in mind as we talk about digestion this evening. <clears throat> now, again, eating is a little bit more complicated, right? We, we, we need to invest energy in it. But we also need to put something else into our bodies in order to break things into smaller pieces. Does anyone have any ideas what that is? Here's a hint. Don't stress, everybody. Take a big breath with me. Ready? Everyone, inhale. Exhale. Oh, yeah, very good. Does anyone have a clue yet? Excellent. Oxygen. Man, we just have like a huge IQ over here. These people are geniuses. Wow. Uh, yeah, you need oxygen to eat your food as well. Uh, and so gases, gases everywhere. What a fun evening already. Uh, we're taking sugar, every life's favorite form of energy. Uh, we're adding a little bit of oxygen, which is a gas. We're breaking sugar up into gas. So bubbles everywhere. You know, digestion is a messy, bubbly process. And we're going to see that this evening. Um, but as it turns out, some things don't need oxygen to eat their food. And you and I are kind of one of these things. Um, normally, 
right? And we've kind of seen this equation before. So this is all chemistry we've all looked at already. But normally we take one sugar molecule, we give some oxygen in the mixture there, uh, and through various cellular processes, we generate a bunch of carbon dioxide, more gas, uh, and energy, pow. And does anyone have a clue where all that carbon dioxide gas goes after we make it inside of our bodies eating it? You, when you exhale, you're getting rid of a bunch of gaseous byproducts. So your mouth is not only like the fuel input part of your body, it's also the like smokestack to just blow out all this gaseous waste. So, you know, think about that next time you uh, burp in someone's direction. Okay. Uh, so, so we know how aer aerobic respiration works. You take oxygen in, you break sugar up into CO2. Wonderful, wonderful. But what happens when you don't have oxygen? Uh, well, we still start with sugar, of course. There's that yummy energy locked up in that beautiful molecule right there. Um, but in this case, you know, we're not adding oxygen, so we don't quite get as many CO2 molecules out of the uh, equation as we did before. Uh, we get some other fun stuff. Uh, some of it's fun, some of it's not so fun. Um, one of the fun things we get out of this reaction is ethanol. We'll talk a little bit about that later this evening. And then we also get lactic acid. Uh, and this will be one of the one of the few shout outs I give to lactic acid, but if we have any uh, athletes or people who regularly exercise in the audience, uh, you'll be very familiar with muscle fatigue and sort of muscle soreness. And those are your muscles doing this exact equation. Your muscles are consuming sugar in the absence of oxygen. This is your anaerobic respiration. Um, and we're actually just one mutation away from being able to make alcohol in addition to lactic acid as a byproduct of anaerobic respiration. So this means, you know, we're just a few DNA base pairs away from getting drunk every time we exercise. Wouldn't that be fun? Um, but alas, we don't. We get lactic acid, which can rupture cells and, and give us cell, cell damage and make us really sore. Um, and then, of course, this wouldn't happen in nature unless life could extract some sort of useful energy out of this. So, excellent. Um, so, breaking down sugars without oxygen, when you don't have oxygen and you're still extracting energy out of sugar, does anyone know what this process is called? Hint, it's the title of the talk. This is fermentation. Excellent, 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 everyone. Uh, so when we eat sugar without oxygen, that is technically fermentation. Uh, and let me tell you, not all fermentation is good, OK? Uh, say you have a lovely spread of delicious food right here. Um, some fermenting greedy little microbes uh, can do really nasty things to that. And this is a lesson I learned early in my brewing career uh, when, I, when I mixed a bunch of things up without cleaning them properly and you get this fermentation here. Look at all these wonderful bubbles, but I'll tell you that did not smell great and my neighbors were none too pleased with that little foaming keg right there. Uh, but, but in other places, you know, uh, bad fermentation and food spoilage can look like this. So let's take a closer look at some of these pictures here. <laughs> Um, you know, this is just the thing all of you munching down on your snacks are going to want to look at, right? Uh, let's take a look at some spoiled canned goods here. You know, some, some you know, moldy bread and rotting fruits. And Oh, look at that. Yum. Mm, let me take a look. I see some faces out there. Uh, and they don't look too similar or too dissimilar to these faces. You know, these faces are, are very deliberate and very useful for humans. Um, though they've become a little less useful in the modern day, uh, in the past, faces like this meant don't eat this food, it smells weird, there's something wrong with this, if you put this in your body, you will get sick. And that's right, there are microorganisms that are fermenting and spoiling food like this that generate really foul uh, uh, odors for us. Um, does anyone know what uh, organism this is? If we have any microbiologists, I saw some of my, my colleagues out there today, they should know what this is. Oh, this isn't E. coli, but it's a, it's a cousin. It's a close cousin. This is one of uh, very common food spoilers. This is actually salmonella. Uh, and so here we have it. I, a little, I made a little ditty up once upon a time. Uh, you can know it's salmonella. It has 22 flagella. All right. Well, <laughs> tough crowd. OK. Um, uh, does anyone recognize this? I've heard its name bounce around a couple, a couple times this evening. The, another huge food spoiler. I heard it over here earlier. This is Escheria coli. Yes, this is E. coli, another main food spoiler. Now, these are pathogens. These, these organisms live in our digestive tract normally, uh, but when we eat large concentrations of them, they can end up in places in our body where they really don't belong. Uh, and that can make you violently ill and, and very, very sick. 
Um, and, and that's just by the fact of these organisms being there and your immune system reacting to them being in places where they shouldn't be. Um, but not all food spoilers are pathogens. Some of them actually don't survive very well in the human body. Nevertheless, if they start digesting our food before we do, uh, they can cause really nasty illness. Now, this is kind of a, a cheater question, you know, because all bacteria kind of look like this. But does anyone have a guess what bacterium this is? You got to be really good at your bacteria uh, phenology to be able to see this. I can't even do it. So this is this is Clostridium botulinum. Uh, this is what's responsible for botulism. Uh, and in fact, you know, these these bacteria can uh, kind of live in the human body. It's not their favorite place, but it's not their presence that makes you sick. It's the noxious byproducts that they produce that can be um, very very deadly. Uh, so so Clostridium botulinum botulism is is a very serious food. Well, it can lead to very serious health complications very quickly. Um, this one's kind of fun. Well, it depends on your, I guess, definition of fun. Does anyone recognize this? This isn't a bacterium, but this is a food spoiler nonetheless. Ergo. Uh, yeah, this is ergo or ergot. This is, this is a fungus, and it actually spoils grain uh, in the field. It's a specialist on barley and rye. Uh, and does anyone know what compound this produces that makes it uh, kind of a, a, health, a health concern for people? LSD. Yeah, this, this produces one of the precursors to uh, LSD, lysergic acid. Uh, and in fact, um, the presence of ergot in, in early rye stores in early America was probably what was to blame for a lot of the hysteria uh, surrounding the Salem witch trials, mass hysteria and hallucinations brought on by eating contaminated grain poisoned with ergot. Um, so these food spoilers take innocent lives. They are very serious health concerns. Uh, and, and so, you know, not all food spoilage and fermentation is, is fun and games. Um, and so, you know, we'll end this talk on these little, molec these little microbial villains by saying, you know, there was no Food and Drug Administration 250,000 years ago when, you know, human civilizations were doing what they were doing. Uh, so our noses stepped in and we made these nice little warning faces so that people around us would be like, ooh, better not put that in my mouth. That poor guy did, but I'm not going to. Um, so, yeah, so, uh, but even, even today with the Food and Drug Administration, we are still under threat from critical food spoilers. Uh, and this is largely because they are everywhere. They are in the air we breathe, they are on the food we eat, in the water we drink, in small concentrations, small enough that our bodies can fight them off normally. But nevertheless, these microorganisms are everywhere. Uh, and so, uh, remember, these are kind of little villains. Um, so, we find ourselves in a little bit of a pickle, right? Uh, some germs like the same food as we do. E. coli and salmonella can grow on a lot of the vegetables we like to eat. Um, and some of these germs are capable of making us really, really sick, um, sometimes lethally so, like in the case of uh, Clostridium botulinum and botulism. Um, and some of these organisms don't need oxygen to do what they do. So even putting food in a can isn't going to keep it safe from spoiling. Again, botulism can survive just fine without oxygen in a can. Uh, and as we just saw, these germs are everywhere around us. So what are we to do? Uh, you know, our food is constantly spoiling, uh, or it would seem that it would be. Uh, and so that's a big question. Why isn't our food constantly spoiling? Does anyone have any ideas? Oh, come on. You all kind of have one in your homes, I'll bet. Yeah, we do have some ways to save it. But as it turns out, I got you a trick question. I'm a meanie. Uh, most of our food actually does go to waste and largely in part due to these food spoiling organisms. Uh, so food spoilage is no joke. Um, you know, most of the food we spend all that time and energy growing and preparing, uh, it actually ends up in the trash and a large part of it uh, because of spoilage. And actually I was talking to Larry just, just at the start of this talk about you know, this new HEB over here has way overstocked. A lot of that food is probably going to end up in the dumpster because FDA will say, well, there's too much microbial growth that's had a chance to occur on this, and it's not safe for consumption. Um, so again, it looks like we're in a pickle here. We have all this wonderful food. It's a race against the clock to try and eat it before these microbes get their grubby hands on it, turn it into this, which makes us sick. Uh, but what if, and I heard some of you talk about this, uh, what if we had a way to preserve our food? And it turns out humans are clever little buggers, and we have figured out several methods for preserving food, uh, but all of them kind of have their pitfalls a little bit. Uh, the first is to keep it cold, right? Uh, but the immediate pitfall of this is you can't keep food cold in hot climates. Now, if we imagine we were in Texas 40,000 years ago, you know, that's well before modern refrigeration. Yeah, there's no way you're keeping your food cold back then. And even today, some of the most power-hungry appliances in our homes, such as refrigerators and AC, are there to just sort of keep things cold. 
Uh, and so when we have major brownouts in the summer due to power shortages, it's because of appliances like this. And again, that poses a serious threat for us to be able to preserve our food uh, and keep it safe from these microorganisms. Uh, so even today, hot climates pose a really big problem to trying to preserve our food by keeping it cold. Let's kind of run the other direction then. Let's, let's say, uh, let's use fire instead of ice to keep our food safe. Um, and the great thing about fire is it kills a lot of these really infectious germs that can make us sick. The problem is you're only staving off the inevitable because once that food cold cools down, it's once again in what many uh, health food safety systems call the danger zone. You know, it's now in a, in a realm where microorganisms can grow and infect that food very quickly and make you very sick. Um, so it turns out we can actually cook our food with acid. This is ceviche. This is, raise your hands if you like ceviche or have had it before. Yeah, okay, we got some folks that, that like ceviche. Uh, fish meat is very easy to cook with acid. Um, you can get very similar chemical reactions to happen in the fish meat that you can when you use fire. Um, again, the pitfall here is acid isn't always available. The nice thing, though, is unlike heat, acid, if you put it in a container, doesn't really dissipate. Um, but again, you know, eventually it might still go bad. Um, and then the last thing is adding, you know, this, this is sort of a hodgepodge category, adding a bunch of salt, adding a bunch of sugar, or just letting meat dry out like beef jerky is actually a pretty good way to, to preserve your food. Um, but let's take a look at some salted pork here. Now, let's, let's travel back in time uh, and imagine we're European settlers moving across the Great Plains. This is a really inhospitable environment. Uh, water is fresh water, clean water is very sparse and scarce. Uh, and you're starving to death and you only have like a barrel of water left. Um, if you use that water to rinse the salt off your pork, you're going to make your situation a lot worse. Uh, so preserving food with salt, you got to remove the salt somehow. And that's not always feasible for people and, and hasn't always been feasible for humans. Um, and then sugar is an interesting one. Honeybees use this to keep their honey as sterile as it is. Uh, they just pack loads of sugar by evaporating the water off of their nectar. Uh, and we can kind of do the same thing when we make jams. We can put so much sugar in there that it actually becomes dangerous for microorganisms. Um, but for the vast majority of human history, sugar is like a luxurious commodity that most people haven't been able to afford. So sugar isn't always available either. Uh, so what on earth are we to do? Our food is spoiling in front of us. We need to do something about it. Uh, maybe we could try cooking it with a little bit of biology. Uh, and as it turns out, we can intentionally let our food go bad. You know, let's ride this wave and kind of see where it takes us. Um, but before we do that, again, intentionality is a big word here, folks, because you could be like early Tristan and just forget things in your elementary school locker and then they, they ferment. I wouldn't really call that intentional fermentation, right? No matter what I told my teachers when they were trying to make me clean it up. Uh, but, but we need to be intentional, and part of that is selecting the right microorganisms to do the job. I'll say these are our ideal microbial chef. Uh, can anyone uh, just throw out a hypothesis? What's the biggest thing on the list that a microbe has to be uh, in order to be a good chef? If we're going to put a microbe in our body, what can't it do to us? Make us sick, excellent, yeah. So, so they can't be infectious or, or make us sick. We don't want a microbe that's gonna turn on us once we eat it. Uh, and so there's a couple of factors that actually uh, turn out to be really good ways to tell whether or not a microbe can make you sick. Microbes that need a really salty home, um, the human body is mostly water, it turns out. Uh, I'm sure most of you already knew that. Um, and so microbes that like really salty environments actually can't do so well in the human body. It's just not salty enough for them or they're not used to that. That, that type of solution. Uh, and the same is true for acid. Some microorganisms like really acidic solutions, the human body is actually a little bit basic. Uh, and so microorganisms uh, that like really acidic conditions can't survive too well in the human body. Um, and so if you have microorganisms that can uh, fall under both of these categories here that like salt and acid, now we're cooking with, with microbes here, right? These are good microbes to have on our side to, to ferment food. Um, an added bonus would be microbes that can do this without oxygen, because then we can seal up our jars and put them in cellars. And furthermore, if, if a microbe is not using oxygen to burn away all of the calories in our food, there's something left over for us. And as we'll see, that's something really good. 
Um, so cue the good guys. We talked a lot about E. coli and salmonella and botulism, which are kind of, you know, dastardly villains. But here we have our superheroes, right? Uh, the first one, by and large, this is probably the most abundant and most commonly used organism to ferment foods on the planet. Um, and it's a very broad category. There's lots of different species in this group, lots of different genera. It's hugely diverse. Uh, but these are the lactic acid bacteria, and they like salty, acidic conditions. So they're very good for uh, living in our gut and where they do a lot of good, um, and they're very bad at making us sick. They can't really infect us all that easily. Um, and so these, these bacteria, um, if any of you have had kefir or cheese or yogurt or a myriad of other products, um, you can thank lactic acid bacteria in large, uh, by and large for those, for those products. And then of course, the good guys, uh, this isn't a bacteria, this is actually a fungus, a unicellular fungus, yeast. Uh, some of us, we saw some yeast doing what they do, albeit very slowly over at the natural history table. Um, and yeast are our little bakers. Uh, so they also like really acidic environments. They can also put up with a fair amount of salt. Um, and they make excellent, excellent chefs. By far the second most abundant um, microbial chef we partner with to make our food. Um, but yeasts and lactic acid bacteria are not the only fermenters. They're just the two I'm going to sort of highlight. There, there are other uh, multicellular fungi that are used in the production of things such as sake. Um, but but we, won't, we won't touch on those just yet. But a shout out to those guys as well. Um, and it's worth noting that a lot of the fermented foods that we like to eat are actually a commingling, a sort of a, a collaborative union between lactic acid bacteria and yeast. Lactic, bacteria, uh, lactic acid bacteria chew things up, spit it out. They yeast come along, they go, hmm, I like the look of that half-eaten apple, and then I'll eat it. So they, they do a lot of sort of what we call uh, metabolic co-opting. They sort of take care of each other and eat things and spit things out for each other. So, you know, you might think it's kind of gross, but I think it's kind of sweet. You know, they're, they're taking care of each other. Excellent. Uh, so thanks again. You know, let's give a round of applause to our microbial superheroes here. Excellent. Excellent. Um, those that live in really salty conditions and those that can survive uh, strong acids. Uh, and, and the reason we're applauding these is because, you know, there's many of us in the crowd this evening who have either been technically trained to cook or think we're really good cooks. Um, but when it comes to these microbes, we actually are just left in the dust. Um, and and I'll, I'll, let's go through a little thought experiment here. So we have, you know, these raw materials here. These are all cereal grains. They come from grass. And um, they have tremendous potential to give us nutrients and energy that we need, rare, rare minerals. Um, but those things are inaccessible to us until we have some friends come along and break up some of those, uh, you know, harder shells or, or, or digest uh, compounds down certain molecular pathways that we just don't have in our bodies. Uh, and then you get a final byproduct that's not only more nutrient rich, but more delicious. And as it turns out, it's more delicious because it's more nutrient dense. Uh, let's, let's dive into that a little bit more. Uh, fermented foods are delicious, undoubtedly, undeniably, scientifically proven delicious. And here's why. Um, they, have, they have something called umami in them, uh, which we'll get to a little bit later. Um, but remember, we were talking earlier about how we sometimes have to invest energy to get energy out of our food. Uh, well, we can let these microbes do some of that heavy lifting for us. They will invest the initial metabolic energy to start digesting our food so we can come along and do the rest. Um, and that makes it delicious. When our bodies taste food that's partially digested, they go, yes, give me more of this. This means I don't have to work so hard uh, to get nutrients and energy out of this food. Um, and so these vitamins and minerals and nutrients, one of the big ones uh, are these glutamates. Um, now, there's a lot of stuff in the news about MSG, monosodium glutamate. That's a manufactured glutamate that comes from, you know, giant chemical plants. But most glutamates that we actually eat in our diet come from the natural process of fermentation. They're these wonderful protein salts that are released into solution because of fermentation. And that savory flavor, our bodies crave it because in our natural diets, that was not a very common uh, molecule to come across. But it turns out it's extremely useful for building things like proteins uh, and fats inside our bodies. Uh, and now we're going to talk about another fun thing that makes foods delicious uh, as a byproduct of fermentation, another little chemical. Uh, but this one isn't necessarily a nutrient, though it does have some caloric value. Um, uh, I'll just mention again, when you ferment foods, it can prolong the shelf lives. Uh, but let's get to our, our, one of our favorite byproducts of fermentation, uh, alcohol. 
Uh, so this is just a shout out again to yeast, right? Uh, as a brewer, I just make sugar water and then I give it to the yeast and then they make the alcohol and the bubbles that make beer good to drink. Uh, and that's the same for non-alcoholic beverages like kombucha, except in that case, just swap out alcohol for lactic acid. Uh, your yeast and your bacteria are doing all that hard work for you. So remember this, brewers don't make beer, yeast make beer. Very good, very good. Um, so again, remember, we're going to take a look at where alcohol comes from. We've seen this slide already. Sugar without oxygen gives us some CO2, some ethanol, and some energy. Uh, and we're going to focus on ethanol now. We kind of gave lactic acid its little hurrah. So now we're going to focus in on ethanol, because this is definitely the more interesting of the two uh, molecules, in my, in my opinion. Um, so this is a picture of ethanol right here. It kind of looks like a little broken piece of sugar, right? We were just looking at sugar. This is a little piece of it. Uh, and so who, who does alcohol affect? Um, well, it turns out that not every living thing can experience, you know, sort of the, the side effects of alcohol. Um, and so it turns out that you actually need alcohol dehydrogenase. This is an enzyme that allows a body, a, a nervous system and, and a living, breathing animal body to break down alcohol uh, and, and do it safely. Uh, and result in mildly intoxicating um, uh, other compounds and byproducts. Uh, and as it turns out, many, many, many songbirds have really highly functional alcohol dehydrogenases. And not only that, um, but robins and, and uh, other migratory songbirds actually show, you know, proclivity for eating fermented berries. They like sort of the, we, we assume, right, they like the euphoria and the buzz of alcohol. Um, but it's not only birds that are going after these fermented foods. Uh, here is an intoxicated moose. Uh, this is a cow moose who had uh, spent uh, a few too many nights eating fermented apples and got herself caught in an apple tree. This is up in Maine. They're trying to figure out what to do with her because I don't know if you know how big moose are, but they can stand seven feet tall at the shoulder. These are big critters. Uh, so an intoxicated moose sounds like quite a nightmare. Uh, and, and even some insects actually have really highly functional alcohol dehydrogenase genes. And we're going to take a look. This is, does anyone know what this is here? This isn't a bee, good, good guess. This is a fly, this is Drosophila melanogaster, the, the workhorse of modern genetics here. This is probably one of the most important organisms in the history of biology right here. Uh, and everyone just goes, eh, boring. Eh. Pay it some respect. Uh, so let's take a look at where alcohol is naturally produced in nature, where humans aren't actively trying to make it. Here's a rotting peach. Um, this is a playground for Saccharomyces cerevisiae, our brewer's yeast up here. They're plugging away, digesting sugars, making alcohol, yum, yum, yum. Uh, and inside there we have C. elegans. Does anyone know what kind of animal C. elegans is? This is a nematode worm. Uh, and you can see th right through it. Look at all the organs. You can see all of its organs. Turns out that's pretty useful for biologists. Uh, and then here we have the, the, the fruit fly again, Drosophila melanogaster. Um, you all owe your existence, most of you I would, I would bet, uh, owe your existence to these three organisms. Um, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, the modern brewer's yeast, uh, that is a workhorse of eukaryotic cell biology. We know how our cells work thanks to this model organism right here. C. elegans, a lot of OBGYN care, a lot of developmental biology, our understanding of how organisms grow and develop as embryos and then on to uh, adult organisms is thanks in part due to this organism because you can see right through it and watch its organ systems develop. And then of course genetics, modern genetics, our understanding of genetic diseases and heritability all are thanks in part due to uh, the fruit fly right here. And so these three organisms, again hugely important, can't understate the importance of these organisms and the profound effect they've had on science and biology in our everyday lives, they're, hang they're best buddies. They hang out in nature together all the time. These are best pals. How lucky could a species get? We just have these wonderful model organisms all hanging out in the same place. You know, it's just phenomenally lucky. We're very lucky these guys are all best friends. Um, okay, now fruit flies, uh, we're going to talk about them for just a little bit longer here. Uh, if I can find my cursor, there it is. Uh, because fruit flies actually have a very interesting relationship with alcohol as well. Uh, they actually use alcohol not to get intoxicated, uh, but they use alcohol to protect themselves uh, from a very insidious uh, predator. Actually, it's a parasitoid. So this wasp here, uh, and kind of, if, if any of you, uh, this is getting kind of dated here, but if any of you have seen the movie Alien, 
Um, that's a parasitoid. Basically, these organisms are not quite parasites, they're not quite predators, um, but they lay their eggs in other organisms, and then their babies hatch out and live inside you and use your body's resources to develop, and then eventually they have to get out, and when they do leave, they always kill the host. Uh, and so fruit flies have a parasitoid. It's a little wasp like this. Um, right here, this is, the, this is the fruit fly maggot. This is the ovipositor of the wasp. She's ovipositing in this poor little uh, fruit fly maggot. Um, but as it turns out, the wasps' uh, larvae, the little wasp maggots, are not as good at digesting alcohol as the fruit fly maggots are. Uh, and so some of the most highly functioning uh, alcohol dehydrogenase enzymes in the world uh, are in this little fly here. So it can get super drunk, so it can outcompete and outdrink its parasitoid host and poison it. So it, it's, it's self-medicating with alcohol. Um, so there you go, the world's, probably the world's first true drunkard. Uh, um, but there are other organisms on planet Earth that have an active, uh, you know, alcohol dehydrogenase genes. Here are a lot of the hominids, uh, you know, so at one point a lot of these critters, you know, were foraging and, and sort of trying to take advantage of resources in very similar habitats, um, but only one of them had a leg up, so to speak, uh, on the others. Can you guess which of these hominid species has the alcohol dehydrog uh, dehydrogenase gene intact? It must be us, because we can drink alcohol without poisoning ourselves instantly. Um, that's not to say that alcohol isn't poisonous to us, but, but we can digest it and break it down uh, sufficiently. Uh, and this turns out to be actually a really big deal in early human evolution um, because, uh, you know, fruiting plants, sometimes those fruits don't get taken fully advantage of, so they fall to the ground and they start fermenting. Uh, and these are very pungent events. You can smell rotting fruit from a very far ways away. Um, but if uh, this is one of our closest living uh, ancestral species or uh, uh, closest living relatives here, the chimpanzee. Chimpanzees do not have a functional alcohol dehydrogenase gene. So if they were to eat fermenting fruit, they would skip the drunkenness and go into a pretty dangerous uh, hangover that, that would threaten to sort of shut down their liver and their brain. Uh, so alcohol is actually very poisonous to chimpanzees, uh, but not to us. And this, this gave Homo sapiens a pretty big competitive advantage against other hominid and, and primate species when we were foraging for fruit, because we could eat this rotten fruit, uh, but they couldn't. Um, and as it turned out, we liked what it did for us. It made us feel pretty good uh, when we ate rotting fruit. And so we went about trying to uh, probably accrue as much of this rotten fruit as possible. Um, you know, this is just a cartoon that shows extreme inebriation, but, but mild intoxication was actually a very pleasant experience for early humans and remains to be uh, today for modern humans. Um, and so uh, without alcohol, we might not have had civilization. And, and as one theory sort of puts it, um, you know, these human societies that were, were starving, were looking for food, were constantly food, this hunger sometimes led to desperation. Um, and we would have these huge stockpiles of grain that would eventually get wet sometimes. And when it got wet, it started to ferment. It gave the perfect conditions for yeast to develop. Um, and when we were in our starving stupor, you know, desperation, we maybe not planned as well as we should have. Um, we went and we ate some of this grain. It made us feel uh, quite nice. And then we said, you know what? That was kind of a happy accident. Uh, let's try and do that again. And that spurred off a tremendous amount of investment in grain. And we see a side effect of this in every single human civilization that has ever existed on planet Earth, pretty much. Um, we see this massive investment in these, in these advanced civilizations in growing grasses that have these really starch-rich grains in them. Uh, and this is true, again, around the world. Wherever you go, wherever there were big civilizations, some sort of starch farming happened. Um, and so grasses, grasses everywhere, all the drop to drink. Uh, in Asia, rice was domesticated and largely uh, used to produce an alcoholic beverage, a rice wine, uh, also known as sake. Uh, in the Americas, corn was domesticated rather quickly, which is very useful for producing um, a natural fermented beverage called pulque. Um, interesting enough, corn actually doesn't have a tremendous amount of a very important enzyme, but that enzyme also exists in human spit. So in order to make pulque, um, what a lot of traditional, uh, you know, American indigenous peoples would do is they chew on the corn and then spit it out and then get sugar that way. 
Uh, so, you know, kind of like the yeast and the lactobacilli, right? Like they're all taking turns digesting different parts of the food for each other. Uh, and then, of course, the big famous one in the Western world, uh, barley and wheat and rye uh, were domesticated and beer is a big alcoholic beverage. Of most of our barley production now goes to making beer. Um, so again, um, grasses are hugely important. It's because they have these giant molecules called starch. Now this looks really complicated, but guess what? You're all very good chemists now. So these little, these little sh circles are just drawn in a bigger scale down here. We know what that is. That's just sugar. Sugar and sugar and sugar as far as the eye can see. And grasses are really good at putting sugar in nice, neat little lines like this. And so if we grow a bunch of grass, we can get a bunch of sugar, feed a bunch of yeast, make a bunch of alcohol, drink a bunch of alcohol. It's no surprise humans domesticated grass over and over and over again, trying to get after this, this uh, side effect from it. Um, another little note, this is, this is a common myth, actually, a wives' tale I sort of encounter here and there. Um, people are like, well, breweries were great for their local communities back in the day, because you could drink beer if clean water wasn't available. Beer is a diuretic. It doesn't help you stay as hydrated as you'd like. But the reason breweries were really important to help clean, make clean water available is they had these giant vats on hand at all times of water that they could use to make beer. And they would boil this water and kill all the microbes in it and then have it on hand. Uh, and, and this remains true today. This is as true today as it was in, in, you know, in the 11th century. Um, you know, we saw with the snowpocalypse a year ago, uh, a little over a year ago, that, uh, you know, a lot of our water treatment facilities went down, but local breweries rose to the occasion and they were like, hey, we got a bunch of clean drinking water and we just distributed it to our local communities. Um, so, so breweries can have a pretty big impact on the communities they serve. Um, and this is just one small example of that. Um, so we talked a lot about alcohol. Here are our friends yeast again, you know, gobbling down sugar. Uh, we talked about the alcohol waste they produce. Um, but now let's talk a little bit about some of the fizzy farts they pop out, all right? Um, so ethanol is not the only thing that makes fermented foods uh, a ton of fun here. Um, remember this friendly little molecule we've been chasing all evening? This is carbon dioxide gas. Here's Calvin, you know, enjoying one of the many pleasures carbon dioxide gas can give you, uh, a belch. And so again, we're talking about bubbles, uh, bubbles, bubbles everywhere. Um, and bubbles are not only important for helping alleviate tummy aches with like a ginger beer or, or you know, enjoying a good belch from uh, time to time, but they're actually incredibly important in, in making things like bread. Now, bread is something that's been available to people for a very long time and has fed many, many mouths and staved off many, many famines. This is a very important food group right here, made possible thanks in part to yeast and the CO2 bubbles they produce when they start to digest the starches and sugars uh, present in dough for bread. So you have bubbles again to thank for you know, your nice lofty bread. Um, and now I'll just end the talk uh, by saying, you know, we as humans are great at like figuring things out and figuring out how to get nutrients out of our, our food. And we also kind of like to you know, get a little, a little tipsy from time to time and act silly. Um, but, but there's certainly much more to fermentation than just getting nutrients and, and feeling silly. Fermentation is more than just a, a science. It really has become an art. Um, and it's allowed people to sort of express themselves uh, in, is ma in many ways, just like a painter you know, or, or a composer would express themselves, people are able to express their ideas through these fermented foods. And my favorite part about this is that fermented foods, unlike Beethoven's fifth, are transient. You have to enjoy them in the moment, whereas Beethoven's fifth is, you know, sort of immortal. Um, so these works of art really force you to be present in the moment to enjoy them. Uh, and and we'll, we'll start to wrap things up. Uh, raise your hands as I start to click on these, through these following foods. Raise your hand if you couldn't live without this food. I'm going to get almost all of you right off the bat by saying this fermented food is essential in most of your daily lives. Coffee is fermented. Keep your hands up if you need this to survive and to get by day to day. Uh, chocolate. Chocolate is a fermented food product. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, pizza. Nearly every ingredient on a pizza is fermented from the dough to the cheese to the pepperoni. Yeah, that's all fermented. Uh, beer. I definitely, you know, this is my livelihood. Uh, uh, wine is a fermented food product, of course. Bread, absolutely, a fermented food product here. Cheese, uh, any kind of yogurt or live cultures there. Kefir is definitely a uh, fermented food product. Who here loves olives? I know someone who hates olives here. Isn't, isn't that just despicable? Shouldn't we just shame him? Just everyone help me shame. Oh, boo. If you don't like olives, boo. Yeah, very good. Uh, 
vinegars. Vinegars are definitely fermented. Um, any kind of vinegar has got some sort of mother of vinegar. It's a unique concoction of lactobacilli and yeast. Uh, pickled fruits and veggies, um, you know, sauerkraut falls into that category. Uh, salami is a fermented meat. Um, pepperoni is also a fermented meat. Any salad dressings you may have almost always have some sort of vinegar component, which means they're fermented. Um, some wonderful, you know, sauerkraut, uh, like we already mentioned. Tartar sauce has a bunch of fermented food products in it. Ketchup, although it's not fermented anymore. Heinz would like you to believe that they still actively ferment it. They just add vinegar, but that vinegar is fermented somewhere with, with live cultures. Uh, anyone have trouble pronouncing this word? Yeah, yeah, Worcestershire sauce. Yeah, that one's that one's fermented. Um, lots of different fish, and, and this is actually in the Nordic countries. Pickled fish are fermented very commonly. Um, uh, of course, kombucha. Yeah, that's a fermented product. Uh, does anyone know what kind of culture pr produces uh, kombucha? Is a very special acronym we we like to throw around for this. Scoby. A scoby. Yeah, and scoby just means a symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast. And you now know what those are. You, it's brewer's yeast, largely, uh, and then some different strains of lacto. Basili. Um, any kind of soy sauce, this is a fermented product. A mayonnaise, some people love it, some people hate it, um, but traditional mayonnaise is made with vinegar, which is fermented. And kimchi, kimchi is fermented. In fact, you know, I, I could keep going uh, with the rich, rich fermentation tradition of Eastern countries, but you know, that, that we would be here all night. Um, but but any, any, a lot of Eastern Asian cuisine is, is largely fermented. Um, and so with that, you know, fermentation really is everyone's culture, uh, pun intended here. We're all cultivating some really weird, fun, wacky microorganisms. And so it doesn't matter if you like bread to pickles to, to kimchi or to cheese. You know, fermentation is a rich part of your tradition and your heritage. And so it should be easy for you to get excited about this because somewhere along the way, some microorganisms fermented something that's important to you. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. Um, and so with that, you know, I think it just seems fitting to thank everyone who made this possible, especially all of the EEB graduate students who are volunteers with SUTS. They make these evenings possible for the speakers, for the attendees. Uh, I'd like to throw a huge shout out to my fermentation mentors. These are the people who taught me how to, you know, apply skills and, and become a better fermenter uh, tomorrow than I am today. Uh, and then, of course, I have to thank you all for coming out and sharing this wonderful evening with me and letting me talk for, to you for, you know, 45 minutes to an hour about one of my uh, favorite things. I will mention I've been talking about beer all evening, so I cordially invite all of you over 21 to a happy hour at Holdout. Uh, it's just down the street after the talk. Um, but before that, I think we have time for some questions. Uh, so thank you all for coming out this evening and listening to me ramble about germs. All right, so let's, let's take some questions here. Uh, anyone have some questions for me? This is always my favorite part of the talk. I have a question. Yes, sir. How is pickling different than fermenting? Yes. Yeah, so good question. The question was, how is pickling different from, from fermenting, or, or are they different? Uh, pickling is a form of fermentation, um, and a lot of times it's done in sort of open crocks, these big clay vessels. Uh, and you put all kinds of raw vegetables. Cucumbers traditionally are, are what we think of when we think of pickles, but you can put any kind of vegetable in there. All vegetables have some sugars in them uh, that, that uh, lactobacilli, these lactic acid bacteria like Tamantron. Uh, and so there's kind of two pickling forms out there today. One of them's a little bit of a cheater and the other one's more traditional. Traditional pickling, um, the pickles are soured in, in lactic acid, which comes from lactic acid bacteria. And that's a very different tang than vinegar. Vinegar is acetic acid, which is a product of yeast fermenting. Um, but so when you do traditional pickling, you put the lactobacilli cultures in with your fermented vegetable or your unfermented vegetable. And over time, they'll slowly digest the sugars out of that, turn it into lactic acid, and then lactic acid will kill everything else except the lactobacilli. And you get a nice, tart, crunchy vegetable that you can eat months later. Um, now, more traditional pickling, you just boil veggies and then add vinegar back, and so you're kind of removing the microbe from that process, um, which is what most of the uh, grocery store pickles are nowadays, because people are like, man, it's way easier to just pour you know, vinegar in. But again, that vinegar came from a microbe somewhere in a big facility making a bunch of vinegar. So yes, does that answer your question, sir? Excellent, excellent. Other questions? I heard a question over here. Yes, young lady, do you have a question? 
No, oh, we're a little shy. Quite all right. Why, what causes some fermentation in beer to go bad? Uh, what causes some fermentation in beer to go bad? What an excellent question from an inquisitive mind. Uh, you know, uh, this actually, I'll tell you a brief little anecdote here. Uh, once upon a time, there's a very proud people who are very accomplished engineers and fermenters. We're talking of, of you know, the ethnic Germans. Uh, and they were, they, you know, they love beer and, and they get kind of haughty about other European countries doing things better than them, especially things that are, you know, traditionally German. Uh, and so at, at one point, the German beer industry was in peril uh, because something, they, the German brewers were at a loss. They didn't know what it was, but something was poisoning their beer, making it turn sour, producing uh, sour acids rather than ethanol. And so you couldn't get drunk off of this beer. And that's a big problem for German brewers and it took a French scientist to save them, and they were a little rough about that. They were left a little raw that, you know, a small little Frenchman, his name was Louis Pasteur, uh, and he discovered, you know, sort of this microbial theory of disease and also helped save the, the French wine industry and the German beer industry. Um, it turns out, unlike a lot of things, uh, it's really good to have just one kind of microbe going if you want to brew a really clean beer or make, you know, a really fine wine. Um, but other microbes can sneak in there, and they won't make you sick. They'll just make your beer taste really bad. Uh, and so Louis Pasteur figured that out and said, well, you know, you German brewers are actually doing things kind of sloppy, and if you don't want this to continue to be a problem, you have to sterilize, clean, and kill all of the bacteria that are in your tanks or on your tools that you're using. Uh, and, and then reintroduce the microbes that you want. And the German brewers, you know, they had no choice but to listen to his words. And so that's how you can kind of get fermentations that go awry. If you're not careful with sterilization, all sorts of wacky things can get in there and cause you a, a fun time. Yes, indeed. Larry, a question from you, sir. Ah, uh, yes, stomping grapes. So as it turns out, you know, you would think that it's not very sterile to take your bare feet and stomp on a bunch of grapes, right? But it turns out there are yeasts that specialize in living on the skins of grapes. Uh, they're called Bayonis yeast. And when you stomp on grapes, you're definitely introducing all sorts of wacky microbes that can definitely turn fermentation into a, a you know, less of an art and less of a science. Um, but the Bayonis yeast are so numerous. There are so many Bayonis yeast that they're easily able to outcompete any other weird fermenters. And that's how you get this tradition of, of stomping on wine grapes in France. Um, now, most wineries only do that as a sort of a tourist attraction because again it's a lot less predictable than than sterilizing tools and deliberately and intentionally inoculating your your wine vats uh, but it still is in practice in some very traditional French wineries and I'm sure other wineries elsewhere excellent question excellent question other questions mm -hmm. yes over here yeah, so uh, this question is, do I know the wild yeast of the area? You know, this is something I have caught a lot of flack for in my early, younger days as a brewer. Uh, I was excited, you know, the world is a, it was my oyster. There's so many cool yeasts, wild yeasts out there that have yet to be discovered. Uh, and as it turns out, there are, there are multi-million dollar companies that are out there, you know, just scraping yeast off the bottom of shoes and, and off of mushrooms and, you know, the sides of dumpsters and stuff. And they're sequencing the genomes of these yeasts. Uh, and if you find a wild yeast, there's a very high likelihood that its genome, at least in part or if not entirely, has been sequenced at, a, at, a, at one of these yeast labs. And if you're a brewer, you can surely take a wild yeast, you can play with it, culture it, cultivate it, and be like, wow, that was really interesting. I really like what that, that did. You can send a little sample of it into these yeast labs, and they'll go, how much beer do you want to make? And you'll go, oh, I'd like to make, you know, 300 gallons. They'll go like, nah, think bigger. We can do bigger. And they'll be like, okay, 3,000 gallons. They go, sure. They, they mail you a crate of like 200 pounds of this yeast. And you're like, where did you get this? You know, I scraped this off of a little mushroom growing on a stump outside in my, my yard. You know, did you come to my yard and steal it? No, they, they have that genome probably on, on their files. And if not, when you send them a little sample, they'll freeze it and add it to their archives and propagate it up. And, and they have the facilities to make these huge vats of yeast for, for brewers. Um, so wild yeasts are definitely uh, not being used as much as they could be in beer. Um, but the yeast companies are there ready to and I'll tell you this, it'll cost you an arm and a leg <laughs> to order that kind of yeast. Uh, but it definitely exists. And, and the only way you'll find those wild yeasts, of course, is to go out and just you know, look for them and then use them. And then you can order them from a, from a bigger uh, firm. Or you could grow them up yourself, but not many places have the capability to do that. Excellent question, excellent question. 
How are we looking on time for questions? Do we still have good, enough time for some questions? Excellent. Five minutes for questions. So yeah, keep them coming. Keep them coming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, Emily, in the back there. Oh, oh, we have a question up here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, good question. Uh, so, you know, the question was, you know, uh, a lot of us like to ferment at home. That's how I got into beer, was home brewing, playing around with, with fermentation. Uh, and the question is, is it dangerous? Uh, there are definitely health risks that come with trying to, you know, deliberately spoil your own food. But a great rule of thumb, and one, again, that we, you know, sort of perfected 250,000 years ago, is if it makes you make a funny face, if it smells weird, don't put it in your mouth. Uh, if it's good to eat, your body will, will tell you. It'll, it'll smell good, it'll look good, it'll taste delicious. Uh, and so that's a green flag. If it doesn't look good, if it doesn't smell good, even if it doesn't smell bad, I wouldn't put it anywhere near my, <laughs> my mouth. Mm -hmm. Excellent question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, other questions? Yeah, over here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Yeah, excellent, yeah. excellent. So the question is: Before we had the ability to, you know, practice sterile procedure and be really intentional and deliberate on how we inoculate our fermented foods, you know, how were how were people in the past doing that? And the big answer to that question is essentially: We were we were lucky, and we've been doing it for so long in the same place that those places where that food and that beverage is made is just dominated by the microorganisms that we use to make it. And so uh, that that worked for a while, but again, in 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 the case of Louis Pasteur coming to the rescue of the German beer community, uh, it doesn't work forever. Uh, and you're, you're going to need someone who knows what they're doing in order to save some of that tradition. But by and large, you know, these really old breweries that have been in Germany for five, eight, you know, even, even 900 years in some cases, they've been doing it for so long in the same place that the air is just rich with these cultures. And they don't even have to inoculate their brews. They can just leave the vessels open and they start fermenting naturally from the microorganisms that have just been there forever and ever. And another cool side effect that you get from this is sometimes you can't stop infections from happening. Uh, and when that does take place, you get the generation, in some cases, of an entirely new style of fermented food. And so I know beer really well. Uh, and so the Berliner Weisse is this really sour wheat beer. And once upon a time, the wheat beers brewed in Berlin were not sour. They were, they were pretty delicious. But at some point, uh, a sour, a sour uh, producing organism, an acid producing organism, got in there and became a part of that culture. And the Germans were like, well, you know, the Berliners were like, we can still get drunk off of this, we'll roll with it. And they did, and now it's a style, a, 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 you know, a widely emulated style. So every once in a while you have these accidents that turn into happy accidents. But that, I will reiterate, is by far the exception, not the rule. Accidents have no place in fermentation science generally. Uh, normally, they are not happy accidents, they are putrid, nasty, vile accidents that make your neighbors angry with you. Yes, indeed. Question. Um, sourdough bread in San Francisco, is that mm. because the, the air in San Francisco has sourdough yeast? Yeah, there's, there's something about San Francisco, uh, is it's got this yeast that does this really wonderful thing. And, and it's kind of a similar story to the, to the Germans uh, with, their, with their beer, and then Louis Pasteur comes along. But in this case, it's kind of the French that got a little angry. For a long time, France, and especially Paris, was this you know, sort of mecca of yeasts. And it's the perfect bread making, and they really perfected it. Um, but then, you know, when uh, you know, settlers were moving across America, and we, we found you know, San Francisco, this was also probably largely in part due to the gold rush, there's just this yeast there, and it leavens bread beautifully and not only does it leaven bread beautifully it makes it delicious this yeast is now commercially available we've sequenced its genome we know all about this San Francisco sourdough yeast but it's very true that there was just this yeast that was in California that that made excellent bread and all of a sudden these these American bakeries were able to rival some of the French and and European bakeries um, so that was very cool mm -hmm, mm -hmm. question in the back oh. one last question yeah go ahead Eric Yeah, so ethanol production, um, 
Yes and no. So the question was, uh, is ethanol production help make things safe in addition to sort of salts and acids? And I will say that largely not. It's not at a high enough concentration to pose a, like, to be sanitary, like a rubbing alcohol would be. Um, and you can use ethanol like rubbing alcohol. You can dilute it down to 70% and use it to sterilize your hands just like you can with, with isopropyl. But um, what it does do is it makes physiological costs for other microorganisms higher because now all of a sudden they also have to contend with this toxic byproduct. Yeast are really good at it because they've had to deal with it their entire existence. Um, but other microorganisms, not so much. It's the acid drop. When the yeast start creating all these organic acids and spitting them out, that pH drop is really what starts to like sweep and kill infectious, dangerous microbes across the board. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's it for questions. Again, if you all have more questions, I'll just be down at Holdout later this evening. Uh, so feel free to join me over a pint. Uh, but thank you. Uh, I will hand it back off to uh, Allison here. Thank you so much, Tristan. That was such an engaging talk. Um, thank you again for coming out this evening, and I hope you join us next month for Adaptations for Climate Change. Thanks, volunteers. Thank you. Yes.